Bobby, uh, Omi passed away. His mother, she passed away. And so I'll be conducting the funeral on Friday. And I want to ask you uh, to remember uh, Bobby and his sister and their family. And also, let's uh, pray uh, that God will help me Friday in, in that uh, service. So I would appreciate that uh, so very much. I want to say it's good to see Brother Rick and them back. Would you give them a hand? Glad to see him back uh, in the Lord's house tonight. We're glad to have Dr. Tatum. Let's pray and ask God to bless us in the service. Father, we love you tonight. We're grateful for our time together. We're grateful for the opportunity that you have afforded us to come into your house. We know tonight, God, that you're on the throne and that you're just a prayer away. Uh, God, you said the effect to a fervent prayer of a righteous man uh, would availeth much. And we thank you for that promise and we believe it tonight. We ask you to touch Brother Loftus, touch his body tonight, Sister Loftus. Uh, God, give her strength, Lord, we do ask. Lord, we pray now, God, that you touch Bobby Horton and his family uh, in their time of loss. Touch the service Friday and let everything be pleasing, well-pleasing unto you, Lord. Father, we ask now that you would touch Dr. Tatum tonight. We're always honored to have him with us. We pray now, God, that you'd anoint this choir for all you do. We'll thank you and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. We want our choir to come tonight. Let's come and worship the Lord. Thank you for you that are joining us by live stream. Uh, we welcome you into our service tonight, and I trust it'll be a blessing to you as well.
thankful tonight you've been set free how many can testify to that tonight the Lord Jesus Christ has set you free I was thinking about the song that we sang right before this last song talking about uh, the Lord and his friendship and I don't know about you tonight but I'm thankful that he is my friend I'm thankful that he can be counted on and uh, got to thinking about uh, the different characteristics of a true friend 
Uh, you know, when we talk about true friendship, this is what it means. It means a person that is supportive of you. If you've got, if you've got a, a true friend, that means that they support you. Uh, it means that they're loyal. It means that they're honest. They show empathy. Now, a few nights ago, uh, I've been going about every other Monday night picking Rylan up. He's been taking a class uh, at the sheriff's department that he's really enjoying, and he was selected out of his high school along with other students from the county to be able to partake in it at the sheriff's department. He got in the car a few Monday nights ago, Dr. Tatum, and he looked at me, and I said, well, Rylan, how'd your class go? He said, it was great. He said, you know what I learned tonight? There's a difference between sympathy and empathy. And I said, yeah, that's true. And he began to share with me. Well, you say, well, what do you mean? Well, if you let the word sympathy up, it means it's a feeling, it's feeling compassion or, or sorrow or pity for the hardships that another person may encounter. That's what sympathy for them. But empathy is putting yourself in the shoes of another person. And there's a great difference there. Well, a true friend, he shows or she shows empathy. And then there's respect. That's what a true friend is. There's trustworthiness. Uh, there's, uh, you know, a, a sense of not being judgmental. It means that you can depend on them. They're generous and uh, they're a good listener. They're patient with you. Uh, when I think about all of those characteristics of a true friend, listen, that describes Jesus, doesn't it? I mean, he's honest with us. He's trustworthy. Uh, we can call on him. He won't judge us as far as, uh, you know, just try to cast judgment on us. He tries to help us. And he tries to uh, show us that empathy. And I'm glad that he does. I'm thankful tonight that he said that if we'll obey him and honor him, that he has the ability to open the windows of heaven, the Father does, and bestow blessings upon us that we won't have room enough to even receive it. I I think we ought to give him praise tonight for his goodness, uh, his friendship, and his loyalty. Now, I want to say this for Dr. Tatum comes tonight. Probably all of us uh, have, have known somebody that said to us they were our friend only to find out that they were not our friend the way we thought they were our friend. But Jesus has never failed us. He's never let us down. You say, well, preacher, I called on him one time. He didn't show up. Listen, just like uh, uh, Mary and Martha learned through Jesus uh, about the sickness and eventual death of their brother, he may not come when you call, but he'll come right on time. How many know that tonight? And uh, I want to tell you, I love him, and I'm thankful that he allows me the great privilege to serve him. And that's what it is. It's a joy and a privilege to be a Christian tonight. And I tell you, I appreciate your loyalty and faithfulness to God, and I know that he does uh, as well. Let me move on. Let me uh, mention to you, don't forget the service Sunday morning, Sunday night. Brother Michael Stevens and his wife Amy uh, will be with us in both of those services. He'll be preaching, and uh, we're looking forward to having them and hosting them them so you come and uh, hopefully bring somebody with you if you're watching by live stream I'd like to encourage you to come if at all possible you're going to be blessed in those services on Sunday and then of course uh, April is moving right along getting it moving along pretty quick for you it is for me it's just zooming by it seems and then right after Sunday uh, we'll be looking forward to the month of May we've got our next uh, we've got our next uh, uh, community outreach singing with the Perrys on Thursday night the 30th uh, keep that in mind this coming Saturday. Uh, Brother Franklin, you want to stand and just mention from the pew what, what's going on Saturday so ever, all the men know. Yes. Right. Right. Yeah. <laughs> but everybody got the message, I think. We love you. We're looking forward to a good time in the Lord this Saturday morning at 7 o'clock. We're going, to, we're going to pray, and then we're going to feast, and then we're going to pray and talk about fasting. How's that? Have a good time. So all the men, if you're a, a, a male factor in this church, a man, you come be blessed. I know we're going to have a great time, and I appreciate Brother Franklin and all that he does uh, with our men's fellowship. Would you give him a hand tonight? I appreciate all that uh, that's going on. Amen. 
All right, we want Dr. Tatum to come. I want to say while he's preparing to come again, what a joy it has been to have him. And uh, he's doing a tremendous job. I'll tell you, last Wednesday, he blessed me. I thought multiple times throughout this week, even thought about today. I can just see when that charger was, the, the, the lid of that charger was lifted. And I, in my mind, I could just see John the Baptist just smiling at them. them uh, you know what he brought out last week? It was wonderful, powerful. I'll probably never look at that story the same again. But you worship, give him a hand as he comes and let's get in here and learn from the word of God tonight. Amen. God bless you. Good to see you tonight in the house of the Lord. I appreciate you being here and uh, looking forward to uh, sharing with you tonight from the word of the Lord. Uh, I'm, uh, I'm, I agree with your pastor. I'm glad that Jesus is my friend. Praise God. He is a friend that sticks closer than a brother. And uh, he has been with me through thick and thin for many, many years and in many, many situations. And I thank him tonight. I do praise him. I want you to turn in your Bibles tonight to John chapter 18. We will be uh, there. Uh, probably get into chapter 19 just a little bit. But I want to put on notice that we will also be going into Matthew 26 tonight, just a little bit, some uh, cross-referencing right there in regard to some of the things that we want to say, and so uh, uh, we'll, we'll be doing that. Tonight, we are transitioning from chapters 13 through 17 uh, into chapter 18. Of course, chapters 13 through 17, we gave you a handout, and uh, we talked about all of the ways that Jesus was uh, wanting to encourage his disciples who were obviously very discouraged. And so we went through all of those things and that's somehow or another I wound up with John the Baptist and uh, blessed you, praise the Lord, amen. And uh, so, uh, uh, but uh, we are transitioning from that into chapter 18. We moved from a farewell address really is what it was in chapter in chapters 14 through 17, especially in a private room into a garden. And of course, we're going into the Garden of Gethsemane. One of the main themes that we find in this particular setting is the idea of movement. I hope that you'll kind of keep that attached to your brain just a little bit. And uh, we will be uh, talking about that uh, at different intervals in this particular study tonight. But it's the idea of movement. And uh, like I said, we'll explain that a little bit later on. Note, note in chapter 18, verse 1, it says, When Jesus had spoken these words, what words? The words that he just spoke in 13 through 17. He went forth with his disciples over the book Cedron, where was a garden into which he entered and his disciples. It tells us that Jesus went forth, or in other words, he went out of the place where he was and he entered into the garden or he went in to this garden. This idea of movement in regard to Jesus is the picture of freedom of movement. Jesus is doing whatever he wants to do. He can leave a place. He can go into a place. Uh, notice the place that he leaves, this room with his disciples, and the place that he goes, the Garden of Gethsemane. Of course, you know that the reason that he went into the Garden of Gethsemane is that he is going there to pray. And he is going to be praying for God to help him deal with what is getting ready to happen in John's gospel. I believe the meaning of the word Gethsemane is oil or olive press. It is obvious when we look at the story by comparing the four gospels especially that Jesus is being hard pressed in this place. In fact, it will tell us that he will, uh, it doesn't tell us in John, but it tells us in Matthew, and we're uh, 26, 36 through 46, so we're going we're gonna, to uh, borrow from that particular story. 
It tells us that Jesus three times went to prayer. You know the story. He left some of them out there. He took three of them a little bit closer to where he was going to be praying. And he said, watch and pray with me here. And then he goes just a little bit further and he prays. And he's asking God again for, for strength. He, in fact, he even asked the Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not thy will, but thy will be done. And I, and I think that, that he's teaching us something about prayer right there that we need to understand is that it's okay to pray. If it is your will, let this happen. Let this pass from me. Let this, let this be removed from me or let this thing take place in me. But nevertheless, not your will, but not my will, but your will be done. So, so Jesus is teaching us something about prayer in that passage of Scripture. It's okay to ask. But we also must understand to submit to the perfect will of God for our life because he knows what is best. Do you not think that the Father would have loved for some other way to have been found for Je in, in, in regard to Jesus? Certainly he would. But the Father understood that this was the only way, the only method whereby the mission of Jesus could be fully accomplished in this particular moment, in this particular time. So he goes there to pray. And again, he goes back and forth to pray three times. Now, I, I, I want to look at that for just a moment. And in noticing that three times that Jesus went, and, and I want to think about the olive or the oil press. They tell us that in order to get the best oil from the olive, okay, that it took three presses to bring that out. In the first press, the oil comes out, which represents the first fruit. This is the first fruit in regard to the oil, okay? Jesus went in one time in order to get the first fruits out. The second press was there was a little bit more pressure applied in this particular press, and this allowed the, the good quality oil to come out. Now, in this particular oil, it, it was oil that they would use for healing. Did Jesus not come to heal us? Praise be to God. Not only that, but they could get food out of that oil and be used for food. And did Jesus not feed 5,000 one time? Did Jesus not feed 4,000 one time? In other words, Jesus is a divine provider. And, and so that is pictured right here. So, so as he is going in and being pressed more and more, more of what he came to do is coming out. And so this, this, this prayer that is being offered in this time, in this garden that's being offered, oh, praise God, when, it, when he takes it to Calvary and, and sheds his blood through the eternal spirit of God, uh, all of those things that Jesus has prayed, all of that that has been brought out by the pressure that is upon him is, is applied unto us. Today, again, thank you for talking about Jesus being our friend. Because Jesus is our friend. The benefits of what happened not only at Calvary, but in the Garden of Gethsemane is applied unto our lives as well. Do you not think that the Father was hearing the prayer of Jesus? And then there is the third press. After they, uh, you would think that they've got, but no, there is the third press. And even more pressure is, is placed upon this. And it's, it's, it is meant to get every possible drop out of that, okay? And, and with that particular pressure, they would use it for lamps to, to help uh, create light in the lamps. What, what does Jesus say? I am the light of the world. Not, on, not only that, but it also is used for soap. They would put that in soap. What does soap do? Well, soap 
cleans us up, doesn't it? And so Jesus Christ, he, he, he cleans us up. We, we, are, uh, we are made clean by Jesus Christ and, and the blood that he shed for us. So I just wanted to picture that for you. When Jesus is doing that in the Garden of Gethsemane, based upon Matthew's account, those three times that he goes in, each one of those times is play, uh, uh, there's more pressure applied unto him and it's bringing more and more out of him the benefits that he provides for us. So the picture, now let's go back to John chapter 18. Okay, the picture of freedom is overshadowed in this text by the approaching of Judas and the forces of darkness that are with him. Look at it. And Judas also, which betrayed him, knew the place for Jesus. Jesus oft times resorted thither with his disciples. So he knew where Jesus was going to be because he had frequented there many, many times. Jesus is going there to pray. Oh, praise God. Je Jesus was used to praying. Th does that teach us something about prayer? Let's look at verse 3. Judas then, having received a band of men and, and officers from the chief priests and Pharisees, cometh hither with lanterns and torches and weapons. Rem rem I, 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 don't, I can't remember if we even mentioned this or not, but when Jesus tells Judas... Uh, to, to go out after he the, the, the sop deal right there tells him to go out. It says Judas went out and it was night or it was dark. All right? So, so the, John is kind of making some connection right there in regard to this. That Judas is going out into the darkness. Now we see, I, I know it's night right here, but it doesn't say anything about the disciples or Jesus having lanterns. But, but, but here's what it says. That they come with their lanterns and their torches and their weapons. Lanterns and torches are artificial light. Artificial means of light. You don't have to have artificial means of light when you've got Jesus. Jesus is the light of the world. And you and I, as we are in him, we are also the light of the world. And it is not an artificial type of light. It is a supernatural type of light. Come on, praise God. They also come with weapons. Yes, it is. Jesus does not need, we'll get into that in just a minute, but Jesus does not need weapons. The Bible tells us that the weapons of our warfare are not carnal. But they're mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds, casting down imaginations, and every high thing that would exalt itself against the knowledge of God. Oh, praise be to God. That is our weapon, the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. Oh, praise God. But they're coming with these artificial weapons they, they need in order to defend themselves. In fact, uh, uh, in, in John chapter 18, when, when Jesus, uh, when they come to arrest Jesus and, and, they, and he says, who are you looking for? And, and they say, we're looking for Jesus. He says, I am he. And you know what it says there? And, and it said, they fell over backwards. Oh, that must have been a powerful picture. They just fell over backwards when Jesus simply uttered three words, I am he. Of course, the I am is the, is the Yahweh, uh, Jehovah reference of, of Exodus when, when, God, when Moses says to God, who shall, you, who shall I say has sent me? God said, you tell them that I am, that I am have sent you. All right, and so they understood that. They, they, they realized what, what it was. So, so Jesus says, I am he, and they, and they fall over backwards right here. Now, we're emphasizing this idea of movement in regard to this text. So I want you to note chapter 18, verses 12 and 13. Now, now we said earlier that Jesus had freedom of movement. He could go in, he could go out. He could do whatever he wanted to do, all right? But in 18, 12, and 13, then the band and the captain and officers of the Jews took Jesus and bound him, look at verse 13, and led him away to Annas first, for he was father-in-law to Caiaphas, which was the high priest that same year. Did you notice those three verbs right there? It says that Jesus was taken. He was bound 
and he was led. Now, we, we must juxtaposition that with the idea that when he said, I am he, they fell over backwards. So, so uh, you know, I mean, if Jesus would have wanted to, he, he, he could have stopped it right then. But no, what does he do? He puts himself into the hands of those men. And they are, they are now, because he will submit himself to the will of the Father and put himself into their hands, they will take him, they will bind him, and they will lead him. Look at chapter 18, verse 24. Notice what it says. Jesus was sent bound to Caiaphas. Now, Annas had sent him bound unto Caiaphas, the high priest. So, so, so they, they, again, the idea that they're telling him where to go, they're, they're, they're binding him, and they're sending him to where they want him to go. Before it was Jesus going in and out. And then one more, look at chapter 18, verse 28. The Bible tells us, then led they Jesus from Caiaphas unto the hall of judgment, and it was early. And they them, Now, I want you to remember this, because we're going to come back to this a little bit later on. We may come back to this very scripture and read it again. But, but anyway, unto uh, uh, the hall of judgment, and it was early. And they themselves went not into the judgment hall, lest they should be defiled, but, but that they might eat the Passover. Okay, so, so again... Here, Jesus, it tells us that he was led from Caiaphas and they lead him unto the hall of judgment. This is where they are leading him to the place where he is going to receive the judgment of crucifixion. Now, there's something interesting that happens during this time. And uh, I want us to look at chapter 18. While all this is going on, I want us to look at chapter 18, verses 10 and 11. Again, something interesting happens during this arrest scene. You're familiar with it. It says, Then Simon Peter, having a sword, drew it and smote the high priest's servant and cut off his right ear. The servant's name was Malchus. Look at the next verse of Scripture. You're familiar with it. Then said Jesus unto Peter, Put up thy sword into the sheep. The cup which my father hath given me, shall I not drink it? I find a couple of interesting things. I'm going to be going to Matthew 26 in just a minute. So uh, 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 I want to read a passage of scripture there to you. But, but, but anyway, I find, I find a couple of things interesting right there in regard to that particular story. Because uh, it says that he cut off his ear. Now, if he cut off his ear, his ear was attached to his what? His head. I figured that out all by myself, all right? All right. So, so one of two things was going on. Either Peter was so expert at, at wielding the sword that, that he... He was he aimed for the ear and he got the ear. Or Peter was aiming for the head and missed. You choose, okay? Whichever one you want. But but anyway, anyway, uh, he cut his ear off. What does Jesus do? Jesus will take the ear and he will place it back upon his head, and now he can hear perfectly again. He would have been able to hear with one ear, but not as good if you got two ears. That's, that's what they tell him. That's the reason God gave us two, so we could hear perfectly, all right? And, uh, and, and so why does Jesus do that? Well, number one, I think he's showing his compassion. I think he's showing his love. I, I, I think he's showing his empathy, like, like you were talking about, Pastor. I, I think he's showing all of those things right there in that particular situation. Uh, uh, but, but not only that, but I think Jesus was showing us something else. By putting that ear back on Malchus, he was making sure that he could hear perfectly. And what, how, how do we get saved? You know, it, it, faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. So Jesus was looking down the road in the future and Jesus was saying, I, I, I don't want this guy to have his hearing messed up. I, 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 don't want him, I don't want it to be messy. I want this guy to be able to hear perfectly. Now, the Bible never tells us where the Malchus ever got saved. 
But I mean, just think about this for just a moment, folks. One minute, he's without an ear. The next minute, he's got an ear and hears perfectly. That just, did, he couldn't just shrug that off. Honey, I, 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 I was doing my job tonight, and guess what? Somebody cut my ear off, and Jesus put it back on. It's nothing. It's, it's, it comes with the job. No, that, I don't think it was that particular way. I, I think this man experienced this miracle, and, and I somehow or another just, just kind of hope and believe that sometime after the resurrection, when the gospel was preached throughout Jerusalem, that Malchus may have been one of the 3,000 that got saved on on the day of Pentecost. I, I can't guarantee it, but 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 it, it's as much possible as it is impossible. Praise be to God. So so there's that. But but again, in, in that particular story, John doesn't bring this part out, but I, I want to borrow from Matthew. Let's look at Matthew chapter 26. And I want to read three verses of scripture to you. Verses 52 through 54. And again, you're familiar with the text that I'm going to read to you, but I want you to notice what it says. Then said Jesus unto him, Put up again thy sword into his place. For all they that take the sword shall perish with the sword. So it's same, 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 same basic story, same basic time. Now listen to this. Thinkest thou that I cannot now pray to my father? Right now. I've been, I've been over here praying and I've been, I've been asking the Father to let this cup pass from me, but I've been, I've been willing to yield and say, not my will, but thy will be done. But listen to what he says. Thinkest thou not that I cannot, cannot now pray to my Father, and he shall presently, presently means presently, okay, presently give me more than 12 legions of angels, verse 54. But how then shall the scriptures be fulfilled? That thus it must be. I don't know. They, I, there's probably something wrong with my mind. Because I start analyzing things. Okay. I, I, when I look at that particular passage of scripture. And, and, and so. Uh, I want to do some ciphering right here. Anybody remember the Beverly Hillbillies. Jethro Bodine. Okay. When he's talking about doing math. He, he said. I did some ciphering. So I, I, I want to do some ciphering right here. Now let's, 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 let's think about this. Do we have anything that can help us understand exactly what Jesus was telling Peter and those people that were right there? I think that we do. It is found in 2 Kings chapter 19, verse 35. Don't have to go there, but that's that passage of Scripture where it says that in one night, one angel killed 185,000 soldiers slicing and dicing, cutting and slicing. <laughs> In one night, one angel killed 185,000 soldiers. I understand that the night in the Hebrew mindset was from 6 p.m. to 6 a.m. So I, I figured that's what, it, that's what it was talking about. So if that angel started at 6 p.m. And, and, and slicing and dicing until 6 a.m., he was able to kill 185,000 soldiers. He had 12 hours to do it. Here's where the cypher comes in. Y'all are going to be impressed with me. That means that every hour... He killed 15,416 soldiers. Wow. That means that every minute that went by, he was killing 257 soldiers. That means that every second, every second of those 12 hours, 12 hours that went by, he was killing four soldiers. Four soldiers died every second for 12 hours to reach the number of 185,000. Wow. You don't want to mess with no angel. Amen. You don't want to mess with no angel. You want them to be on your side. I like that scripture says, are they not ministering spirits for the heirs of salvation? 
and they will bear us up, blessed at any time we would dash our foot against a stone. Oh, glory to God. Now, let's look at this idea of legion. A legion in the Roman uh, 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 idea could be anywhere from three to 6,000 soldiers. We'll take the bottom number. 3,000, okay. Now, Jesus said that, that I can pray to my father. Let's go up to verse 53. Go, go back to verse 53 again. Notice, notice what it says. Give me more than 12 legions of angels. That means that one legion of 3,000 times, we'll just go with the 12, means 36,000 angels. Pastor, I believe that those 36,000 angels were standing on the brink and the portals of glory. I believe that they were just there and I believe they were saying, Jesus, just say the word. Just say it. Please, please, Jesus. We've been dealing with these people for 4,000 years. They're crazy. Don't, don't die for them. Just, just say the word, Jesus. We're, we're ready to come. The, 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 the Father has said we could. All you got to do is just say the word. Please, just say it, Jesus. But he doesn't do it. Mm. Thank God he didn't do it. For you and for me. Yeah, I give him praise in the house of the Lord. I'm not through suffering. 36,000 angels. Killing four, on, based upon the, you know, the 185,000 deal, 36,000 angels based upon the number four per second means that every second, if, 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 if those 12 legions of angels had been unleashed upon this world, that means that every second, 144,000 people would have died. Some people say there may have been 100 men that came with Judas to arrest Jesus. A hundred men against 12 legion of angels. Oh, great. Day. It would have been over in a nanosecond. Okay. But he, 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 even if that, and, and we sing the song, he could have called uh, uh, 10,000 angels, I believe, to destroy the world and, and, and set it free. Of course, it wasn't just 10,000. It was, it was at least 36,000. If, if our math is holding up right here, oh, praise God. So, so think about this. At that time in the world, they tell us that there were 300 million people upon the earth at that time. That means at the rate that they could do it, okay, 36,000 angels going and literally destroying the whole world, it would have been over in less than 35 minutes. Oh, glory to God. Hallelujah. In fact, Pastor it probably takes you longer to preach one sermon than, than, than for those angels to have wiped out the world and set Jesus free. To God be the glory. But that's, that's just the power that God has. We, we, we need to understand that. Oh, hallelujah. Oh, man. That, that, that blesses me. I don't know about you, but that, that, that blesses me. That blesses me. In fact, I, I started... At about 20 after, it's a quarter till. It had just about been over. Okay, I'm still going. But it had just about been over by the time I started until that was done. Let's go back for just a few minutes now again to this idea of movement in regard to the text. As the story moves forward in John chapter 19... Okay, we, we, we were told that he was taken, he was bound, he was led. But as the story moves forward in chapter 19, verse 1, I want you to notice what it says right here. Okay. Then Pilate therefore took Jesus and scourged him. Okay. So he's taken. He's taken. And now he's being beaten. And the final picture of Jesus in their hands is found in John chapter 19, verses 13 through 18. I will not take time to read it, but here's, here's basically what it says. Number one, it says that they took him. Number two, they led him away. 
Number three, it says they crucified him. He could have called those angels, but no, he didn't. And so they take him, lead him away, and they crucify him. So the idea of movement in, in this text is very, very important. And I, I want you to see that. But, but it's also important from another perspective in my last few minutes here tonight uh, in, in regard to the issue of revelation and rejection in regard to Jesus. Let me explain this. Let me try to explain this, okay? So again, the idea of movement is very, very important in regard to this idea of revelation, Jesus sharing things, but also the rejection of the revelation. Let's look at chapter 18, verse 28. I said I was going to come back to that, so, so I want you to notice what it says right here in 18, verse 28, okay? It says, Then led they Jesus from Caiaphas unto the hall of judgment, and it was early, all right? And they themselves went not into the judgment hall. So here's the picture that I want you to get. Pilate is on the inside of the judgment hall. The Jews are pictured as being on the outside of the judgment hall. They won't go in. They don't want to defile themselves. Are you kidding me? They're getting ready to crucify Jesus. They don't want to, they don't want to uh, mess themselves up. They want to eat the Passover. The Passover's right there before them. Uh, oh, pe people's... Oh. Forget people, okay. Uh, they're on the outside of the judgment hall. Jesus is on the inside. As the trial of Jesus progresses, here's the part that I want you to get. Pilate goes in and out from one to the other. Pilate is pictured in the next few verses of scripture. He'll be in there with Jesus. He'll go out to the Jews. He'll come back into Jesus He'll go out to the Jews. He'll come back to Jesus. He'll go out to the Jews. Let, well, let me, let me explain that. Look at chapter 18, verse 29. Okay? 18, verse 29. Notice what it says. Pilate then went out unto the... Pilate was in the judgment hall. That's where they brought Jesus. Pilate then went out unto them and said, What accusation bring ye against this man? Let's look at verse 33 of chapter 18. All right, notice what it says. Then Pilate entered into the judgment hall again and called Jesus and said unto him, Art thou the king of the Jews? Are you seeing this? Pilate is going out to the crowd, the Jews, and he's coming in to Jesus. Let's go to chapter 19, verse 4. Notice what it says, okay? Chapter 19, verse 4. Pilate therefore went forth again and saith unto them, the Jews, Behold, I bring him forth to you that ye may know that I find no fault in him. All right, let's go to chapter 19, verse 9. Notice what it says in regard to Pilate again. And went again into the judgment hall and saith unto Jesus, Whence art thou? But Jesus gave him no answer. So let, let me say it. Let me say it to you again. Jesus is on the inside of the judgment hall. The Jews are on the outside of the judgment hall. Pilate goes and talks to Jesus and he listens to him. But then he goes out to the Jews and listens to them. Pilate is going back and forth. How many of you understand that you cannot go back and forth? We either listen to Jesus or we, or, or we listen to the world. I know that's harsh, but that's what Jesus said. I would that you were hot or cold, but because you're lukewarm, I will spew you out of my mouth. Jesus said, you're either for me or you are against me. So we cannot keep listening to the voices of this world and try to listen to God. We got to make up our mind that we are going to listen to God and God alone. I, I, I know it may be unpopular. I know it may cost us something down the road. But it is very, very important for you and me to draw the line in the sand and not cross that line and say, here I stand. I'm going to serve Jesus. I'm going to follow Jesus. I'm going to go with Jesus. Hallelujah. So on the inside of the judgment hall, Jesus provides inside information. The Jews can't get it. Why? They're on the outside. But on the inside of the judgment hall, Jesus will provide inside information for a while. Then it says, you know, but Jesus gave him no answer. After you, after, you know, 
you're not listening. There comes a time that God don't speak. That's a sad time, Pastor. Oh, Lord. Please don't ever quit talking to me. I don't care. I don't care if you got to chastise me. I, I don't get. Don't quit talking to me. Oh, please, Lord, please, please, please. So, uh, so on the inside of the judgment hall, Jesus provides inside information concerning the, concerning the true meaning of His kingdom. Let's look at verses thirty six and thirty seven. Notice, notice what Jesus said. Chapter eighteen. I'm sorry. Chapter eighteen, verses thirty six and thirty seven. Jesus answered. My kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, then would my servants fight? Now there's the question. Is he talking about those disciples? Or is he talking about the angels? Probably both. Because we just found out in Matthew that he could have called 12 legions of angels. And, and, and Peter certainly, I, I mean at this particular moment, Peter's willing to fight. And, uh, uh, but but so, so then would my servants fight? that I should not be delivered to the Jews. It seems to lend to me that he's talking about the angels. Right? Because what could those 12 disciples do against all that crowd? But we know what those angels could do. Four men every second going down, okay, that I should not be delivered to the Jews. But now is my kingdom, is, but now is my kingdom not from hence. In other words, my kingdom is not of this world, Pilate. Pilate. My kingdom is not of this world. My kingdom is of another world. It is not a literal kingdom yet. It is a spiritual kingdom now. But one day it is going to be a literal kingdom. Oh, hallelujah. And those of us who love him and serve him and follow him, the Bible says that he's going to reign upon this earth for a thousand years. And we are going to rule and reign with him. Oh, glory to God. Aren't you excited about that? I'm glad I'm a Christian. I'm glad I know Jesus. I'm glad he's my friend. Oh, hallelujah. I, I'm glad that, that he was willing to go to that cross and I praise him every day of my life and thank him for the salvation that he has given unto this old preacher man right here. Praise God. Pilate hears this. Pilate has to process this, what Jesus had just said. But the Jews don't hear this because they are outside of the revelation. Unfortunately, Pilate also goes out to the crowd and he listens to them. Who are you listening to, church? Who are you listening to? So as Pilate goes back and forth, he will more and more listen to to the voice of violence and the voice of death. One more passage of scripture and we close tonight. Let's look at chapter 19, verses 14 through 16. Here's what it says. Chapter 19, verses 14 through 16. And it was the preparation of the Passover and about the sixth hour and he saith unto the Jews, Behold your king. Verse 15, but they cried out, away with him, away with him, crucify him. Pilate saith unto them, shall I crucify your king? The chief priest answered, we have no king but Caesar. Are you listening to what these people are saying? These people were covenant people, Pastor. There was the Mosaic Covenant, there was the Abrahamic Covenant, and there was the Davidic Covenant. The Davidic Covenant was simply this. God said, there will not be a true king of Israel, but unless it comes from the seed of David. Please explain to me where Caesar comes from the seed of David. These people were so messed up. These people were so jealous. These people were so envious. These people were so crazy. These people were so much in darkness. I could go on and on and on. That they will literally say, we deny the Davidic covenant. And no, but we don't have a king over us but Caesar. These were people who hated the Romans. They hated to be under their domination. And yet 
yet they will reject their true Messiah, their true Savior, their true one that can lead them out of sin and out of depravity and they will accept a man like Caesar, Caesar who was totally depraved and crazy. That's who they will accept instead of Jesus. That's how messed up people can get. They'll turn to everything else. But I'm glad that I'm speaking to a group of people at the North Gaston Church of God who understands that Caesar is not your God. Caesar is not your king. Jesus is your king. God the Father is your God. Hallelujah. We belong to him and no other. And I don't want any other. Praise be to God. Hallelujah. Give God praise in the house of the Lord. So here it is. Therefore, excuse me, then delivered he him therefore unto them to be crucified. And they took Jesus, here it is again, led him away. And what are they going to do? They're going to crucify him. Freedom of movement. But then he puts himself into their hands and how they treated him was terrible. Let's take just a moment and just thank the Lord. Would you do that? Just thank the Lord before Pastor comes. Thank the Lord for this wonderful salvation. Lord, I just want to thank you. I want to thank you that I'm on your side. Oh, hallelujah. I, I, I want to thank you for this marvelous salvation that you've given to me, to us. And I thank you, Jesus, that you was willing to go to Calvary. I thank you, Jesus, that you didn't call those angels when you could have 2,000 years ago. But you went and you fulfilled scripture in order that we could experience this that we have. Lord, because of that, don't let us ever cease to praise you. Don't ever let us cease to thank you. Don't ever let us cease to serve you, Lord God. And, and, and so we give you all the glory, all the honor, all the praise. Give the Lord a good praise offering in the house of the Lord one more time. Well, I think we can do better than that. Let's give him another hand of praise tonight. Praise the Lord. Oh, come on, let's stand up and praise him now. Come on, let's give him praise from the depth of our heart and soul tonight. Hallelujah. Praise his wonderful name. I tell you, I'm glad I'm on his side, aren't you? I know, I'm telling you, the Lord is the difference maker, and I'm so thankful, as Dr. Tatum said, for his love, his commitment. How many are grateful for his friendship tonight? He's your friend, and he said, I'll stick closer to you than your own brother, your own mother. You name the, the, the member of your family you've got. He said, I'll be closer to you than them. And I believe that tonight. Are you enjoying Dr. Tom Tatum? Would you let him know it one more time tonight? I'm telling you, he's blessing me. And I appreciate so much him being with us. Thank you for being here on our uh, midweek service. I appreciate it. Got a good looking congregation tonight. We're so thankful uh, you are here. I want us to pray and I want us to ask God to touch us until we meet again. Let's pray. Father, we love you. We are so thankful for the word of God, the word of life that speaks to us. And Lord, we thank you for the man of God that you've sent our way. And I pray, God, you'd keep your hand on Dr. Tatum and his wife and family. I pray, God, that you continue to bless the church here. This is your church. It's not my church, but it's your church. And I pray, God, that you'd use this church, Lord, to reach lost people and to help people get the deliverance they need. Help us as believers to be discipled and to grow. We're saved by grace, but help us to grow in that grace and become greater in Christ. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. God bless you. Shake hands. Hug next. Be friendly. Get to Brother Tatum. Let him know you enjoyed his message tonight. And thank you for joining us on the live stream. God bless you. See you again. The Lord willing, Sunday morning.